Ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. The waves were first theorized by Albert Einstein in 1916 as part of his theory of general relativity. Created by violent collisions in the universe, they help open the door to a new way of observing the cosmos. Through them, scientists could gain knowledge about enigmatic objects, such as black holes and neutron stars, and an insight into the nature of the early universe. It's creating waves, not only in science, but also across a human race that is increasingly curious about mysteries of the universe. What was it like for you, to, at the very beginning, to realize this could be mm. the real gravitational waves? It takes time to process. What were like, the symptoms of yours when you cannot process something? Uh, you, you sort of leave it at the back of your mind, and then <laughs> you just, uh, you know, you don't know what you're feeling. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> in the subconscious, uh, it's a big thing, but it's like, I, I don't Did you feel... try to call, talk to your colleague? Did you try to talk to your wife about this? And... Uh, hmm. I'm not supposed to talk to my wife. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> it's still supposed to be a, quite a it's, secretive it's a process. It's a secret. Yeah. yeah. And I talked to my colleagues within the collaboration. Um, I talked to them about different aspects of the, of the event. And I feel very happy. But, you know, it was it's really surreal that this, really, this thing can happen. Because, well, even though for like 15, more than 15 years, I've been working on the, the theory of the interferometers. I've been working on the theory of the black holes, collisions of black holes, and data analysis of methods. Right. We treated everything as real. But then when the thing became uh, confirmed as being real, it's still pretty shocking. You know, as I look back, um, the whole story is actually very surreal. It's mm. actually, um, it's beyond imagination now that it, um, it's really... Um, it happened. It happened. It, uh, you know, I was a theoretical physicist, you know, for, for you know, I could study something, you know, pretending it is real for years, and I don't have to care whether it's real, but now it is, <laughs> and then it feels suddenly, <laughs> it's very different. And what did you and your colleagues know? The thing that you discovered could be gravitational waves. Well, we started, um, we knew about the event, like, a couple, right after it was uh, um, discovered from the data analysis process. And then we, at the beginning, we thought, well, this was a little bit big um, signal. Is it really real? Is it real or is it an injection or is it an artifact from, the, um, from noises? But then from, um, you know, as time passed on, uh, we became more and more sure that this is a gravitational wave event. And then we became very excited. When did you share it with all the others? How did the confirmation process go? Well, we first um, talked about the event within the collaboration. You know, there are um, experimental physicists who were who looked at different channels, data channels, and different uh, the states of the uh, interferometer at the time of the detection, and they confirmed that um, all the environmental uh, disturbances were not uh, the effect, were not causing this event, and they also uh, made, confirmed that there were no so-called injections from uh, either um, the, the, uh, the devices or the software. And then, um, on the other hand, uh, the experts of data analysis uh, looked at the quality of the data, and then they compared the data with predictions of general relativity. And then, from that side, also confirmed that this was a, uh, was a real event. That really happened within a couple of weeks. And then what happened was we have to make sure what is the real so-called uh, statistical significance. We have to quantify uh, what is the chance of this kind of thing happen without being a true event, but being an accident. And then we, um, through really complicated, uh, sophisticated uh, data analysis and the statistical methods, we confirmed that this is a so-called five sigma event, which um, corresponds to a false alarm probability of one per 20,000 years. Mm -hmm. So that was a really small probability that this could be a false, false alarm. And how did you celebrate after the confirmation process was done? 
Well, we were not supposed to celebrate, uh, even though we were sure about the. How event. come you are not supposed to do this? You are not supposed um, to do that. Because this was a very special field. In the 1960s, um, Joel Weber announced the uh, detection of gravitational waves, and later on, it was found out that it was uh, not real. So the field became very cautious. Mm -hmm. That the collaboration became very cautious. That we want to be sure that this is a real event before we announce it. And also, you know. Um, there was a, actually a few months of time um, after we confirmed this is real and the announcement. And during this time, we were writing a bunch of papers, like right. actually 11 papers. We had a one paper that summarized the detection process, the physics, uh, the astrophysics, and we had like 10 companion papers, uh, each one uh, providing details about uh, the device, details about analysis method, the details about the signs, and so that to support the, um, the, the detection paper. So in this way, when we announce the, the event, uh, scientists from all different areas of uh, you know, astrophysics, they're able to know what's really going on. So we have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. And you know, writing papers and making sure um, things are right, uh, coordinating between the big collaboration, it takes a lot of time. It is. So on the one hand, extremely excited about this right. possibility. Right. On the other hand, it has to be extremely cautious and calm. Right. Because you really want to make sure every detail is correct. There's also an element of competition because after we announce the detection, um, other physicists are going to think about what it means to be having detected this. What's mm -hmm. the consequences? And as a collaboration, we want to take advantage of this first detection you know, on our own first. For example, we had a paper about testing general relativity using this event. Mm -hmm. We were comparing the data with theories of rel uh, different aspects of relativity. And we want to make a statement about what it means to be, ha um, what, what this event means in terms of testing relativity. You know, after we announce it, other people are going to think about new ways of te testing this. Right. But we want to do uh, as much as we can uh, before we announce, right. so that uh, you know we take a little bit of a advantage. But is this blown out of proportion? Do you think that the enormous amount of attention that this had enjoyed compared to, let's just say, other basic science research? Yeah, I think so. I was never expecting this to be this scale, and it didn't. It wasn't this scale in the U.S., for example. In China, it's a very special place where it. You know, because I'm also Chinese, and people see me being a Chinese, and they're excited. Some Chinese guy is part of the effort, and right. they're very happy. Um, and also, in, in, in China, the medium focuses a lot more on these kind of signs, and they try to take different angles, and they try to report it in, in different ways. People try to sell the you know, anti-radiation uh, suits. <laughs> you know, what a, what a, what a great, uh, what a great, Business. what a great culture, <laughs> what right, a great culture. Uh, nation, you know? It's, it's a movie. You know, when I saw this uh, anti-radiation suit, I, I like it so much. But how is that related <laughs> to uh, gravitational waves? Do we know? It's not related. <laughs> but I mean, um, science gives you an excuse to imagine. And that, mm. that's, uh, that's very nice. Right. How do you get used to yourself now being a quote unquote big star already uh, as a scientist and also, I mean, just as a young person? Well, it's a very, uh, you know, um, very exciting. Um, I think this is all gonna go away. People are applauding for you. You know, they want your signature. They want to shake your hands. They say, "Wow, you're one of the most important scientists we have ever met." You know, things like that. <laughs> yes, I think just five years ago, I would be so nervous if I were to give a lecture to like maybe 200 people. But this time, <laughs> I I don't feel nervous at all. Stardom, as a scientist. Is that likely to help with your research, to get more resources and attention mm. for this field? Or is it likely to distract you from the real thing that you want to focus on? How are you adjusting yourself? I think it's all going to go away. And therefore, I don't think about this so much. Because I think after I return to the US next week, I'm going to focus on my own research. And then people are going to be like uh, bored. They're going to focus on the next wave of uh, hype. <laughs> Uh, that's, you know, it's fine. I'm going to enjoy the fame, the, <laughs> the, 30 the 15, minute fame. <laughs> uh, 15 uh, days of fame now. I love your answer. What was it like for you, though, to enjoy this process? Um, 
Oh, it's nice. Do you keep a diary or? <laughs> no, I post on my uh, WeChat. Yes, I saw the photos. <laughs> you, you met several of your uh, older colleagues and uh, yeah. they're doing various different kinds of research. You even brought milk powders for some of your, That's right. your colleagues here on the mainland. <laughs> it, it was fun. It was fun. It was fun. And I, you know, I want to enjoy this time as much as I can. Mm. Um, if I, if there's any legacy that uh, could, uh, I could leave, um, maybe people are going to be uh, more supportive of science, mm. and more young people are going to be fascinated about uh, gravitation waves. They don't have to enter the, our field, but they have to know that uh, sometimes uh, science is uh, a lot of fun, and maybe they're going to enter the field of science and engineering, and uh, maybe I can take the chance to, you know, maybe the project itself can give people some kind of lessons mm -hmm. about how the society, how science and technology should uh, influence society. Although gravitational waves were first predicted a hundred years ago, it was not until the 1970s that scientists found indirect evidence of their existence. In the 1990s, special observatories were built in various countries. The Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory or LIGO, was first built in 1994. But it was not until last September that the first detection of gravitational waves was confirmed. Europe also developed its own detectors, including the GEO 600 in Hanover, which was built in 1994 by Germany and the UK. In 1993, work began on the Virgo interferometer in Italy. China lags behind in gravitational wave research, but is now planning more research, such as the major Tianjin project. Different observatories like Virgo and LIGO are sharing and jointly analysing data recorded by their detectors. The future of gravitational wave research is likely to see a lot of cooperation, as well as competition. Uh, the LIGO team and the Virgo team are together within the so-called LIGO-Virgo collaboration. We share our data. That is the uh, US and Europe. US and Europe. And also with Japan, um, the LIGO and the Kagura, there is also a um, collaboration and there's discussions about sharing some part of the data of LIGO to give to the Japanese scientists. So we're actually very transparent. Well, the only thing we want to prevent is to, um, you know, make announcements before we are sure about what it is. Yeah. But I think with, the, with, the, with more detections, um, there, you know, there will be more, the data analysis will be more open. And then the data will become open to the public um, as sooner than right now. There can be so-called national security issues. Mm. Yes. Are you are you concerned? Are you worried? Uh, I'm not worried, but maybe some national security people might be. Uh, there were some stories about uh, the LIGO India detector, because in principle these detectors are very sensitive to the ground motion. Uh, therefore, people suspect that this could be used as a way to monitor seismic activities within the country. And for apparent reasons, some people don't want to monitor seismic, want the world to know about their seismic activities, even though I'm sure there are seismometers all around India already. But <laughs> it's a political issue. Yes, indeed. And uh, in principle, I, you know, I don't think there's any uh, concern. You know, for, for me, I believe in openness and uh, you know, uh, open collaboration between everyone in the world. So therefore, I'm not concerned. In the United States, you've got Caltech, you've got MIT, and even several other universities and research organizations focusing on gravitational waves. And now in China as well, you see Tsinghua University, Chinese Academy of Sciences, at Zhongshan University, at China Beijing Normal University, all are working on various kinds of projects with different kinds of international partners to develop their, the system. Uh, what do you think about this kind of cooperation, competition? I think it's a very healthy environment because you, you really need everyone to have their own um, angle from uh, their own perspective. And they each push the direction they believe is the better. The, what are the, the perspectives now? Well, I think if you look at uh, from Zhongshan University, they started from a technological side, mm. a technological angle. They had already been developing technology for uh, precision measurement uh, systems and they have already been working on uh, you know, space-related projects. So they have a lot of reserve on the technological um, you know, expertise. From uh, the Taiji project, they have been following the European development of space-based detection, and they have, uh, they have a lot of uh, people already working on the theory and working on modeling 
um, the, the, the sources that space detection um, is searching for and also the theory of how to design the orbit. And from Tsinghua University, uh, Professor Cao has a team on data analysis. Mm -hmm. They're really computer experts. They're, they can do the job very professionally, analyze data in real time with the high efficiency. Which of course is extremely important for this kind of research right. project. So you see each of these group have, uh, groups have uh, very different um, angles at pushing gravitational wave uh, research. And all of them have their own uh, strengths and of course, people all want to take the initiative, and that's the great, great thing. <laughs> so therefore, I believe it's just, uh, you know, uh, uh, it takes time to have a bigger uh, gravitational wave community. Right. I hope this detection would, uh, uh, you know, uh, push forward this effort, this joint effort. Sometimes people may have feelings against each other about, oh, who's going to be the leader, but does it really matter? <laughs> it's only it's, natural, right? Yeah, it is very natural, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a human uh, instinct and we just need to channel them in the right way <laughs> to make it a, a, a great uh, you know, field. In China, there's a culture you probably have already noticed after coming back for two weeks. People want things happen and happen fast. Mm -hmm. Professor Chen, what do you make about this culture? How can scientists, different stakeholders change this culture? For different, for different people, usefulness can be different. And for different people want different things. Um, you know, for me as a graduate student, what I wanted was a project of projects I can work on to get some training. And therefore, I can become a better scientist. And therefore, I become more useful in the society. As a professor, I not only have to, have, not only have to do research, but I also have to make sure that I advance some area of science. Um, of course, as policymakers, we have to make sure that the project not only produces science, but somehow benefits society. Mm. But I think each different person can just focus on what is best for that person. You know, for example, there are people who make mirrors for LIGO. These people have to study how to po polish the mirror right. better, how to deposit the coatings onto the mirror, how do you suspend the mirror. You know, they spend 30 years of their life doing that. Are they going to win the Nobel Prize? No, there's no Nobel Prize for mirror making. <laughs> but they, they have their passion. Right. They, they like it. Um, and Professor Thorne, and did he want to win? Maybe, maybe he didn't really aim at make, getting the Nobel Prize. But for him, he wanted to push something to learn something. Um, I, I think the society is a lot, if you start the society from the bottom and up, from the grassroots, each person pursue his own interest, mm. his own passion, her, her, his or her own passion. And uh, it, you know, as long as everyone gets used in the best way, uh, things are, good things are going to happen. If you want to dictate that I want to win the Nobel Prize or we want the Chinese guy to win the Nobel Prize, uh, that's a very difficult thing. <laughs> really appreciate it, Professor Chen. Such a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. All the best, of course, to the research. Uh, yes.